Everybody's doing their own little thing. But being a teacher, I felt like I needed to have my own kids because a parent actually told me, you don't have any kids. You don't know what it's like. And I think they just felt that. They really did. Because I thought it was just a parent. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's a, it's a, it's a new step. It's a brave new step. It's a step that, you know, they didn't even want to put their toe in the Jordan River. And he was saying, you know, you're going to have to step in. And here's God, he's doing it. And, and so what he's really doing, if you go back and somebody asked me last week what we're going to do. You can read the book of Deuteronomy, but stay close to where he is with what he's doing in this on the uh, reckless abandon, right? Because he's stepping us back to chapter 5, verse 11, in dealing with taking the Lord's name in vain. And we're going to deal a lot of talking about that. But here he was uh, needing, you know, they, they needed to clarify because can you imagine? They've come out of the wilderness. They're a generation that has really never, they, all of their families are gone, all right? They're on their own. They're new. That's a, uh, I don't laugh that he called it Generation Rest. We go through what, Generation Z now? Is that what we're up to? Now there's a new one even. I there's even a new one. You know, the millennials and all yes. this sort of things. We had the baby boomers. We've had all of these different kinds of generations. But here we were dealing, we were dealing with the generation test, which they didn't pass the test. All right. But now we have the generation rest, which he's saying, okay, you've got to move on and move in this direction. And, you know, they were entering a, can you, can you, can you ever think about putting your place, yourself in that place? You're entering a total new land. You're getting ready to confront people you've never seen. You're getting ready to confront people that do not believe as you believe. Uh, their values are different from your values. The whole idea, it's a whole new world. You know what I thought about? Our church taking this step from the UMC to the GMC and how brave we really were because we didn't know what to expect, or at least I didn't know exactly what to expect. And I admire you for your braveness because I think that was <laughs> a decision you as a church made and you stepped in and step forward on that. And yes, that's what was where my friend was because he had been, in his family, they had been a hundred years of ministers. His grandfather, his father, himself, and his brother. Uh, and uh, he was asked to relinquish and he had to, and he was on March the 4th. So that okay. was the day his friend says March 4th. Yeah. And so he did. And so that was there. Yeah, it was a, it was a brave issue. And as a matter of fact, it's a brave issue occurring all across America. And mm -hmm. you see, the unfortunate thing is uh, those outside of, the, of America, out in the Central Conference, have not had that opportunity to make that choice, but that's there. But here they are, they're in a new culture. It was sort of like, how many of you traveled into foreign lands mm -hmm. and you don't speak the language? <laughs> and you're not familiar with their cultures? All right. I mean, the, the countries that I've been in, their cultures are different from ours. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of things that are totally out of phase with what I was interested in. Uh, you know, but here was Moses saying to this generation, you've got to listen to the instructions. You've got to read this before you even put your screwdriver into any screw to do what you've got to do. Uh, there, you know, and so they had to retain it. And the marvelous thing about the Jewish faith was something that we did not bring over from Judaism into our Christian side is that there was instructions in the families. Mm -hmm. Everybody had to do it. In other words, when Jesus was quoting, and he has quoted a number of times Old Testament that he was taught as a child. And that was a wonderful thing that occurred for them because they could get there. And so, but think about it. If you've lived in one way in your life and you were ruled and you live by those and what's there, it's stepping out into a new world, into a new peace. What did you feel like when you were released from home, you're on your own, and you stepped out into a whole new brave world? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> but I was the only one in the door not crying. Not crying. <laughs> so you were singing the Hallelujah Chorus. I, hallelujah. All right. Well, I thought about uh, a soldier coming yeah. into the service, how frightening that would be. It yeah. must be, oh, yeah. knowing it's they're going to yeah. a bad place. As a matter of fact, there are points in your life where you say, I I'm afraid. And my yeah. comment is, it's best that you are, mm -hmm. because then you start thinking. 
And that's what Moses is saying to this generation of Israelites. You're getting ready to walk into a world you have no concept of what they're about. Uh, you know, you know, they could mistakenly, as he said, uh, uh, assume they were following God's commands when they really weren't. And they're really not. And we get there and think about that. And so I was just was curious in a lot of ways what it was. But, the, you know, it got me when he said the very first thing that Moses does is review the Ten Commandments. He reviewed them again, and he comes back, but he picks one. He picks the 11th verse of the 5th chapter, which deals with, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. What does that mean to you? Well, it used to, before I read this, it meant saying bad words, you know. But uh, the way he explains it, it's just a lot of things. Doing nothing is used because if God's well, called you to do something and you don't do it, that's being vain or in vain. I'm going to look into that some more. But the fact being is one writer says that committed worshipers reverence God's name. In other words, that's what, that's what he's really saying. Reverence. It, all right. A blasphemy has become one of the desperately sad features of contemporary life. You know, and the Lord's name is constantly dishonored. It doesn't mean you're speaking it in curse words, but you're actually dishonoring it in our actions and what we do. Uh, and, and many thousand children in our society today have no concept. Uh, all they have ever heard of names, names of God's son, Jesus Christ, is blasphemy. In other words, uh, Joy and I were watching some movie the other, other night, and I just almost got up and walked out because... They use Jesus Christ repeatedly like, oh, you know, and then I'm sitting there going, oh, my goodness, you know, what's who's all hearing this? And so so what he's trying to say to them is what we said, you know, the Israelites had such an innate uh, reverence of God that they were reluctant even to mention his name. Did you know that? Yeah, that's why they didn't put the vowels in. That's right. They would spell it G-D or they would say Yahweh. You know, so that was one of the things they did. And so they were there, but they wouldn't do it. So what Moses is saying to them is these desires. But think about the interesting analogy uh, that he gives us about the calf. I thought that was funny because yeah. uh, I remember that. Uh, but it was interesting. He said, our cattle are tame, not wild. Yeah, I wasn't sure what he was telling them about that because I've not ever actually been on a horse with chasing cows. So. Oh, it's fun. It's fun. But, so was he saying that he, by picking it up and bringing it back, that was making it tame? Or was he saying that no, he they just it. didn't have too much to... It he, he had chased the calf until, until it, until it just stopped yeah. and then yeah. he picked it up and laid it over the horse in front of the saddle, I presume, because yeah. I've done that. Yeah. Uh, and he uh, was rode back, and everybody looked at him like he was a, he's a city slicker. He yeah. doesn't really know what's going on. Well, I understood it. You know, it doesn't really apply to this whole thing, but there was some pride in that. I mean, he was really expecting to get a big hey, accolades, you know, yeah. Good for you. And they didn't, you know, they were kind of like, well, they exactly did my blame. Guys, these cattle are taken. I feel yeah. now. I'm, I'm there was there was a there was another thing that he said along. We're going to look at it here in a minute. Was and I'll question it when we get there. But going back to in vain, when we realize it uh, having no real value or significance, and in, in other words, you and I can blaspheme God by not, by how we act, rather than we don't even have to say words. Or you know we you know we think about it. In vain means there's an emptiness. There's means that there is uh, there's no worth involved in it. Uh, it means idle. It means hollow. And when you think about the fact being is is God's name hollow, not hallowed, but hollow like a hole, all right. And or it, it, being in vain means you have no force or no effort. Uh, it's futility. It's uh, uh, I don't know, useless. unprofitable. Yeah, All right. useless. And so you're looking at that, and so that's it. But to take God's that's name in vain. Uh, when I say something, I'm not saying it because I'm 
A lot of people would take that as being using Jesus' name in vain. But I'm actually prayer. praying. I mean, a lot of times I say those things, and they may sound like taking God's name in vain, but I'm actually asking for help and to the one being that can actually help me because none of y'all fussing at me about being late or even accepting that I'm late is helping. I have to pray to God that I can please well. start being on time and do something about it. But... But, but know, don't because you're obviously doing things before you, you're you're busy you're yeah, doing things so like if you're not busy before you come that means you can't do stuff anymore well, you don't want to be there we know but back to where to do. your comment was that people think you're being blasphemous when you say uh, Jesus help me all right or whatever that person really does not understand what it means to be in vain, in, the, in taking the Lord's name in vain. You're not. You're offering up a prayer. But That's some people. Like well, and, and, and the person that does it is it doesn't have. If they feel that way about it, then there's not your problem. It's theirs because they do not understand the difference between a plea and a blasphemous statement. And there's those areas there, you know, to take God's name in vain is to say we are. Christian, but listen to this, but not live a life in keeping with our profession of faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, Jesus said it. As a matter of fact, uh, that was the part that I was excited about was that he quoted in, uh, in Matthew. Look at Matthew, uh, oh, excuse me, Mark 6 through 9. Mark 7, verses 6 through 9. Somebody got it there? Seven. Yeah, Mark seven, four, six. Uh, six through nine. All right. Read it. Um, he, <laughs> he replied, and this is a red letter. This is this is Jesus talking. This now. is a red letter part, so Jesus is talking. Okay. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied the about you hypocrites, as it was written. These people honor me with their these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Exclamation point. And so what he's doing is he's quoting Isaiah because Isaiah was quoting what God said. And he was saying it to him. You know, many of us, you know, we bear his name, being in vain is we bear his name without living under his lordship. So realize it. Because when I, when I was first got into this as a young man, I thought using the Lord's name in vain meant I was cursing and I was using his name in a curse. Uh, and that's it. But it's it's more than that. It's how we live. It's our life. Uh, taking the Lord's name in vain is another way, as you heard saying, you're false believers and you're also hypocrites. Uh, so like a guy said to me, I invited him to church one time. He said, I don't want to go there. You're just a bunch of hypocrites. And I said, that's good. Come on, join us. We need another one. <laughs> and, and so, you know, that, that, so when you look at that, so it, it's there. And, but that's part of the questions that I was wondering about, what, what we thought about it. And uh, any more thoughts on, on, on in vain? Does that have a, any issues with you? Or you have any comments you want to make about that part of it? Then he goes on and makes a comment on page, on the third page of that. I wrote it down as 5-3. To read him, I have to put him by chapters and put a page number so I know where I'm, where I'm going. But... Uh, they were going to be different between this land and where they originally were in Egypt. And then he makes a comment. They lived among Egyptians and helped build the pyramids. Mm -hmm. Don't be Quakers now. They were slaves, though. They were slaves. But the pyramids were built with precision. Oh, absolutely. There were knife edge straight putting together of all the stones. The Bible only tells us that the Jewish 
the Israelites were there were making mud blocks, not stone, all right? And so um, I, I, I'm questioning that part. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but in my own mind, I went back and looked at times according to the calendar and what, when were the pyramids built in what year and so forth. Now there is one, and I want you to go home and look for this one. There's the Great Pyramid, which is one of the seven wonders of the world is still standing. And it's, it's like 0 0.05 degrees off of absolute north. How did it get built like that? Aliens. No. Do what? <laughs> I said aliens. Aliens. But as you know, there is a, there's a group, that you, there's, a, there's an institute in Jerusalem called the Armstrong Institute of Biblical Anthropology. And in that, in their thing, they have an article on Job, the designer of the Great Pyramid. Maybe. Now, I haven't go further, I haven't read all of it, but looking at it, it got to thinking about it, you know, was Job there and doing that sort of thing. So that was it. But I had questions because of the way the pyramid was made and the precision that it was done, they would have had to take care of those slaves. They didn't yeah. take care of them very well because they were that was that was strenuous work. So if they were doing that, then then the Egyptians had to make sure those slaves were in a great health and physical ability to be able to move all of that. So I don't know, maybe they did, but I can't find anywhere in the scriptures saying that they did. I'm not arguing with uh, Mr. the Reverend you know, David. They say that. I mean, if you think about it, though, the things that were built during Hitler's regime, he yeah. wasn't nice to any of those no. people, but they got done. And there's some. I mean, if you watch some of those movies, or things on Saturday, they tell you about some of the things that they did during that time period. It was too. It was also miraculous, but. I, I'm just not sure that they were being really, really sensitive to their needs if they were slaves. Yeah, and, and so that was it. You uh, know. That, that assumes that the slaves were the ones that did, did, that did the design work and the precision work. Well, yeah. again. Who's to say they weren't simply there as grunt labor? Yeah. Well, I, that, that was where I'm coming from. Works. We don't know that. All right, There's no place that I can find, and I wish you would go and do your own resourcing and see if you can find anywhere biblically that involves the Israelites with the erection of the pyramids, the building of them and the construction of them. Because the pyramids were absolute precision. Yeah, we opinion. assume we're smart and that they weren't because they were a long time ago, hmm. but they had knowledge too. Oh, of course so they did. They knew that. Yeah. We forgot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's sort of like my socks. <laughs> matching or not? No, well, they're matching, but guess what they say? They got a picture right. of Einstein, and they say oh. E equals M C squared. Right? <laughs> so, what that that came about, and that because of that, we've learned a lot. Yes. But the fact being is, we've got. In, but there's a lot of things we can't answer. The pyramids, all right. Oh, yeah. The other thing we can't answer is some of the things we see in South America. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's stones that are set with such precision you would not believe. How did they do it? And they we were don't from know. different completely different regions yes. brought in and right. stuff. That's, it's amazing. I think God had a hand. I, I saw yeah. something yet the other day of holographics that had a helicopter. When you look at it, oh. it really is a helicopter. Oh. They found it in caves. Wow. Uh, and I'm thinking, okay. And there was one of a tank. Wow. And I'm thinking, wow. And then all of a sudden I realized, do y'all remember the book written by Van Daniken? Was Jesus an astronaut? Oh, Yes. Because he found in a cave things, there was a picture of looks like a guy sitting in a capsule with oh. all his instrument panels in front of him. Wow. But he did. He wrote that. And I remember that, and people got all carried away on it thinking, well, was he? Well, he did travel in a maze that we never thought, right? <laughs> he did. As a matter of fact, he, he didn't need to say, beam me up, Scotty. Yeah. You know, he was able to ride. Yeah. All right, Welcome so we, we can see that. Well, you are the same one that got started in search of ancient astronauts. That was me. While I was 
Yeah, it was. I remember that search of ancient Israel. Yeah, we, we've had that. But here we have. We have. A, you got to realize, Generation Rest was stepping into a absolute cultural shock, yeah. and Moses was trying to say, "Listen, you're you're getting ready to walk into a world you cannot imagine. Have you ever done that? When you think about that, where they were, they were working. You know." They were going to be around new families. They were going to be around the new cities. They were going to be around total new influences that come. Culture was going to be on them. What's happened to our culture since you've grown up in your in the in the last thirty years? What's happened to our culture? Mm -hmm. It's changed. Cell phones. And now everybody's with a cell. I remember the first cell phone I had had a ten pound battery with it. Yes, exactly. You know, and so now it's what. Yeah. And so it's that's where, but here's what they're getting ready to walk into. It would be like someone walking in had been, well, for instance, you remember after the Second World War, there was 20 or 30 years later, they found one Japanese fellow in one of the South Sea Islands that didn't know the war was over. Uh -huh. He had lived an isolated life. That's shocking. Yes. Can you imagine? coming back in the midst of all this. So here they were. They'd been in the wilderness for 40 years or whatever their length of life had been. And all of a sudden, you know, they were, what he was saying is, you're going to run into a situation that you best be careful and not take God's name in vain. And what that means is don't forget God. Don't turn him away from him. Don't do that. Uh, there are, you know, they were to live in such a way that made their lives attractive to others. Jesus said, what I want you to do is I want people to look at you, and if they know you, it's sort of like that song, they'll know we are Christians by our what? Love. By our love, you know. So what he's saying, I want you to be something so that people will look at you and say, hey, I'd like to follow what you're doing, and that's where they are. Uh, you know, they talk to their children, they teach them, they train them. Uh, when they sit at the dinner table, how many of you talk at the dinner table? Mm -hmm. Our world today is how many families get a chance to really sit down at a dinner table? You see them at the restaurants even looking at their phone instead of talking to each other. Joy and I were doing something and we stopped in a restaurant we hadn't been in a while and we had a good time there. And The waiter was telling us a lot of information. We did not know about that restaurant chain, but it was a good one. But there was a father and a child and a mother. And the father and the child were, they were together. The mother was across the table doing, and I think, you know, you know put that thing away. Yeah. So, but here I am being judgmental, and right, I shouldn't She could be. have been a doctor, saving yeah. somebody's yeah, life. It could have been, I don't know. But, you know, they were to make God's name something positive, and that's what he was trying to emphasize to them. That's what he's emphasizing to us. And in essence, for us to do that, it takes reckless abandonment, doesn't it? Yes. Today, we have to be reckless in our efforts and not, you know, but you can be reckless, but also be in control. Uh, they were to make God's name something positive, something attractive uh, to all around them so that they want to become a part of that. Uh, and he, I like he said, what he, he found the Lord on that day when the U.S. hockey team won the national, <laughs> the world championship. But you should not take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, too often, he says, it's surely not a curse, but it's how we are, you know. Uh, it's sort of thinking about that in our, in our lives. Really understand it. It's much more for you and me to keep reflecting on the changes that God has made in our lives. Sometimes we forget to look at just what is transpiring in our lives and what God is doing. And so uh, I was amazed. I, I was liking what he said. You do not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach. I thought this was rather anatomical, I'll tell you the truth about it. He was telling me what transpires. Uh, and, then, you know, and, then it, and then it's eliminated. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile man. When I started reading that, I, my first thought was regurgitation. <laughs> yuck. And I thought, yuck, I'm like you. I thought, yeah, but what, what, what he's not going to, I was reading. But anyway, yeah. 
So what Jesus is explaining is do not defile the outside. Don't let the outside influence defile you and you start saying things out of your mouth. So Moses is trying to retell him, you're, you're in a new world. You're getting, you're going to, it's not only going to be a cultural shock, it's going to be a living shock of what all you're about. Uh, he was retelling the, the commands and he wanted them to learn the very values of the valuable lesson, but he also wanted them to, to remember what they've been taught. And that was what he was trying to tell them. So he was retelling it. He wanted them to learn that valuable lesson rather than he wanted to let them know about it and expect it because it was going to occur. You're going to meet in the situations that you're saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, I don't know that I should do this. You know, so we're there. And so I was wondering about it. Um, if it goes on to say the world could see that what it was like for a redeemed people to live with the Lord in the universe, God with God universe. Uh, and I got to think it a little bit. I wrote down, it sounds sort of like America today, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. our, our, our whole culture has changed. Our whole attitudes are changing. The, the, uh, think about the first generation in history of our nation. What was it like compared to here we are in the 21st Very century? Very brave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when you think of it, you know, it would be a failure if they went into a land and did not worship or honor God. That's what he was trying to say. Don't lose this. Don't let that influence have. Uh, the old adage of what in Rome do like the Romans do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've said that. You've heard it, right? Mm -hmm. But we also have said what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? <laughs> so we, we're, we're looking at different <laughs> attitudes here. But what we're having is, you know, there's failure. But what he's saying is there's a generation of people who would be an example to the rest of the world. Have you ever been accused of being an example of something? <laughs> or, or, or complimented on being an example of something? Mm -hmm. you know, I never thought too much about them leaving the wilderness and having to blend in to a new society. Culture, yeah. I never thought of that very much. But then that's right, and I, I agree with you. And I think uh, Mark Davis has brought this out for us to really put some thought to it because most of us really thought, well, they went there in Jericho, they, they, they marched, marched around and played the horns and the, the walls come tumbling down. We've all read that. But what he's done is he's got us thinking what really is transpiring in the midst of all of that. It's like our granddaughter lives in France now, all right? She's having to become fluent in the French language, even though we found a lot of people who over there speak English better than we do. But, and, and, and I don't speak French anywhere near the way I should. But that's what we're looking at in this, you know. But it almost sounded like they were supposed to show them a new way of life. Mm -hmm. that's, he was depending on them to go in and show them a new way of life. Man, what the heck? Uh, uh, that's exactly what people do see it. You know, uh, we're there. And, uh, and God's desire is not isolation, but insulation. I like his comment there. Yeah, you read that over several times. Did you? <laughs> yeah, and and I, I'm like you, I read it over several times and I highlighted it. Because that to me was really and truly basically what we are about. When you think about it, we're not in isolation we're in insulation in other words be insulated against it um how many of you have a yeti what what makes yeti such a great product iron i found out later what i said i found out recently it's iron <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right Right. And so what you found is you found out they found a new way of creating insulation. Yeah. And that's, what are they doing for you, wanting you to do to our homes now? Put in new windows, mm -hmm. uh, change your insulation, blow in more, this sort of thing. In other words, what God is saying, I want you not to be isolated, but I want you to become insulated. In other words, continue to grow in the midst Protective and let it go out from there. And so yeah, that's a marvelous thing. So I thought it did. And that, I don't know whether you know it or not, but he quoted from 1 Corinthians, and he wrote, he said, I wrote you in my letter, not 
to associate with immoral people. Paul is writing about the first letter that is lost, all right? There was, there was more than two letters written to the Corinthians, but the first letter, we, it was never found and never redone because he talks about it here in first. This is first Corinthians, and he says, the letter that I have written you, which means that was a letter before that, uh, about associating with immoral people rubs off, doesn't it? That whole thing, I had to read that five times before I yeah. understood it. That part there. Yeah. That verse. Because it's like, what are you saying? You don't, but you do. And then I finally think about it. But, <laughs> well, <laughs> it, when you, you think about it, the, the ninth verse, he's referring. Yes. No, I said, I, well, my yeah. interpretation, let me just tell you what my interpretation is. And, and this is on the next to the last page. It's just the same page. I wrote you in my letter not, not to associate with immoral, immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world. Now let me skip down. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person. <coughs> oh, and I went, I'm going to read that over again about five times. So I'm interpreting that he said that he was saying, um, and I know that there's missionary work going on, but like if I if I if I know you, maybe you're my neighbor, and I and I like you a whole lot. And there's good things you do and all that, but I know that you also are immoral in some ways. That's the person he's saying don't associate with the ones that you know are immoral. Not the ones that you don't know are immoral, or you just think, yeah, well, they're out there, you know, Hitler, and I didn't know him, but I know he's bad. Well, <laughs> anyway, that's that's what it meant to me. I had to read it about five times. Well, what before. what Paul is really <laughs> saying, I think, is that uh, we should not disassociate ourselves from unbelievers, right? Yeah. Otherwise, we would not carry out what God wants us to carry out. In other words, his commandments to tell them about salvation, that we would be doing it. But we are to distance ourselves from the person who claims to be a Christian. Now listen to this. This is really what Paul is saying. Who claims to be a Christian, yet indulges in sinful or sins explicitly forbidden by the scriptures. All right. A person harms others for whom Christ died, dims the image of God in himself or herself. And what he's saying to us as a church is that includes some people uh, is hardly fit to be in the light of the world. All right, we know that. But do so, would for us to really do it, would distort the picture of Christ it presents to the world. In other words, what he's saying is, it's like I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> it's sort of like you know the actions is my you know your child says to you, I, "Am I in trouble? I, I, you don't you love me? I love you, but I don't like what you're doing." And so that's the attitude that what Paul is really saying. You know, it, it, it distorts it. Church, as you and I as a church, must be ready to. Um, Correct, I know that's a hard word for us to think about, to correct, but do the correction in love. That's easy, you know, easier said than done, I know, for the sake of the spiritual unity of us all when we think about it here with us at times. But I thought it was an interesting thing. And then in the 12th verse, uh, where he says at the very end there, the 12th verse of it is says, uh, or revilers, or drunkards, or swindlers, uh, not to even eat with such a but such as one. You know, the Bible is consistently telling you and me that not to criticize people. Okay, uh, and when I look at that, I'm thinking, and I'm walking on myself with golf shoes because I think about it. we're not to criticize, but we do. It's hard not to, right? It's part of where we are. Not to criticize people by gossiping uh, or making rash judgments. And a lot of times 
I've been guilty of that, and, and, and I have to really ask for forgiveness. And at the same time, however, uh, you and I are to judge and deal with sin so that it, particularly where it hurts other people. Yeah. That's, that's kind of that mixed message kind of thing that I alluded to a while ago. It, you know, in a way, it's a mixed yeah, message. It is. Because we know Jesus died for sinners, okay? Right. And, and okay, he did. And, but this is, or God could even eat with such a one. This is somebody professing to be a Christian, but then not no, it's, eating. It's, it's our, that's our thing. hypocrites, isn't it? And then that's what we all try not to be. Right. But it's Paul. You know, it's what a hypocrite. Paul is saying, do not associate with people who take God's name in vain. Yeah. Well, that's what they do. That's what they do. Well, that doesn't yeah. mean we can't reach out to people. But, he, but he, what, he, what he's saying is, though, I think, in other words, Paul's instructions uh, to us is that we should not be, uh, in other words, don't take and handle trivial matters uh, or to uh, take revenge. Or should we be, uh, you know, be applied to individuals with problems between believers? And we see all of that. But it's where the church is to confront. That's what he's saying here. As a church, you are to confront and discipline, and that gets to be a, a lot of times I always thought of discipline was my father's belt on my backside, <laughs> but that's really not discipline. There's no. other ways of being involved in discipline, and you can do it sweetly, but you know, you do it, you do it with sort of a love, and that's, at time, and that's hard to do at times. It's, it's the bravery that, that he's talking about in this chapter, yeah. stepping out that is almost required of us to be obedient to the Lord and to, to his word and what we're supposed to be doing. We have to be pretty brave. I mean, we're, we're not as insulated from our culture as, as we need to be to be freed to do that. And you, you have the key words, and that is we correct our brothers and sisters with love and need to be asked to be corrected. And we're afraid that gets over into judgment, so we shy away from it. Yeah. But isn't our mission here at this church is to lead people to Christ? Right. Amen. And and you can't do you can't lead if you don't get next to them and yeah. throw them away. And that means you got to associate with them. That's, that's, you, you're, you're repeating what Moses is saying to the generation rest. You can't isolate yourself. You got to insulate yourself, but you've got to get involved. You cannot not be there you cannot be the you know you've got to be the example you've got to say oh i sort of like isn't that part of discipling do what yeah. discipling isn't oh that's all of, yes it's it's very much so it, and so we're there in in that part of it and so we're you know, you got you, you got to realize generation rest was getting ready to walk into an absolutely totally different world than they were ever framed up First off, they had not been in any cities in 40 years, had they? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And now all of a sudden, they're moving into the promised lands, and what's there? There's cities. And all of a sudden, that's there. And so, and there's people with farms, and there's, and there's a whole new world for them. And so you have to be careful of it. You know, it's sort of like I like what he said, to be afraid and avoid anything different from what their parents experienced. They said it may work for toddlers. Oh yeah, <laughs> but eventually that next generation will have to be at school. I like this. You got to realize they're gonna, they're associating with everybody else is there. They're going to be in school together. How many? It amazes me that children will move to a new country where they speak a new language. Who learns the language faster children. in a family? Yeah. The children do because they're into it. And then what he's saying is you're going to be involved in all of this, uh, and you're going to have friends. You're going to have coworkers. You're going to have all of this in your life, and I think that I think if we should think about it, he he brought out something that I hadn't really thought about. The last next to the last page, he says at the very top, "This is a time when the subject of Christian schooling or homeschooling comes into the conversation. Should one remove their children from the things like school that might influence them in the wrong direction?" The amazing thing is, I find out is you cannot isolate. You got to insulate. He's right. You can't isolate your children from the world 
I mean, don't get me wrong. I think homeschooling has has a great place in a lot of things, and I think Christian schooling does too. But you've got to be able to work in the in the society. You got to be able to live in it. You got to be able to have it. So I, I mean, it doesn't keep me from loving you. I may not agree with you, but it doesn't keep me from loving you. And and uh, and hearing what you have to say, I want to know about. And so we can't isolate. We've got to insulate uh, what we're going on. If we take the advice of Moses here, uh, nothing's wrong with, he says, as schooling at home. Well, what did the Israelites do? They were schooled at home, on, particularly on their biblical belief. Religion, yeah. Now, I've been remiss at not doing that as I should have, all right? So that's that. But, you know, we're looking at, I look at these issues and, uh, I don't want to give my children a disservice. In other words, Joy and I, yes, we had our children in public school, but we also had them in private school. And there were issues that created for those issues. But there came a point with our children where they were now ready to step in to the public world and and live in it. And, it's, and so that's there, and so we look at it that way. We're called to insulate and prepare our children for the culture they will eventually have to live in. I don't know about you, but I look back upon my life and I think, Lord, did, did I do a halfway decent job or did I screw it up big time? When you realize that we've got them there, you know, giving them, uh, you insulate them. And what he's saying to the Israelites is, your insulation is the Ten Commandments. You live by those and everything else will flow. And they used to be in the classroom. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, well, also, you remember school used to start with uh, opening prayer, a national anthem, and a pledge of allegiance to the flag. Yeah. That's not here anymore. Yeah. Uh, but that's that doesn't keep you from still doing that. Right. All right? right. Uh, I've often laughed. They said there's no longer prayer in school. I said, wait till exams come around. I guarantee you they're, they're offering up. <laughs> That's right. We, you know, I, I, I remember, all of us. I mean, can you imagine how many prayers are said? Of course. Even those that were advocating you can't pray in school, I guarantee you, their children were saying, "Help me on this. I need help. I'm in trouble." You know. So I thought that was interesting. Well, we're to live this way in order to be safe. I think that. Was, I think he made a great statement here. We need. To be, we need to insulate ourselves so that we're safe. I don't mean lock us away in behind a locked door. I mean insulate us against the abuse, against the language, against uh, somebody not liking me. That's their problem, not mine. All right. I mean, how the time when you realize that when you have it, and so it's there. I like his last paragraph. Me too. This kind of thinking is why God is invested in the local church. Now that one scares me. That one makes me think, are we doing what is required of us as a local church? The local church is God's instrument for change in the world that he has created. Are we changing it? <laughs> Going down, I think. God has established a beachhead in every community where a Biblically founded local churches established. I got to thinking about that. Do you realize what our country was like? Do you realize what our Methodism came from? Circuit riders who were riding out all over and taking the gospel into places that nobody thought it would ever get into. As a matter of fact, I got to meet oh, probably the last living circuit rider in Arkansas. He died some years ago and he died, he was over 100 when he died. Wow. He was senior pastor of First Methodist Church, Fort Smith, Dr. Roebuck. And Dr. Roebuck started on a circuit out from Stuttgart, mm -hmm. riding a horse. So when you think about that, God wants us to use our family structure and the local church to reach a world in desperate need of godly influence and example. And that's a biblical statement to me. Absolutely. Most, well, that's why we're looking at it. Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one. It's a task of the family. It's a task of the church. And it was a task 
of the generation rest who are stepping into the promised land for the first time. It points out why we have difficulties now, though. Because there really is uh, a great deterioration in our local everything from families and marriages to schools and... Which brings up his third question. Mm -hmm. Who do you know that has reputable reputation in your community, school, job, or church? That was hard. Do that, what? Was, that was hard. Of course That was did. a hard question. Was That's a tough question. question when you think about it. I named you. <laughs> well, reputable. Yeah. I thought of, Perfect. I thought well, I, was, I always think about, the, there's another thing off of that. That's a root word, but I think of reprobate. <laughs> 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 which, is, which means, I, I remember, Joy's mother had the greatest expressions in the world. I still hear Roberta talking in this day, and she could, she could think the same thing, and I always think of it, he's a reprobate. You know? <laughs> she, she knew everybody well, and I had great a, a, admiration for in her. A small she had great town. insight and always described it. I always said something about a friend one time, or a person one time, she said, well, he's an alley cat. <laughs> And he really was. I mean, she wasn't. She wasn't. She wasn't jumping on it. She was telling the truth about the individual, and so that's. And, and I love that. I, I I want us to be able to see it, but that doesn't put them down. It says you're that way, and I'm going to love you in spite of it. All right. That requires honesty. Of course and it that's does. That's what I was going to ask. Is it seems you know like that that question for what makes a good reputation? Well, it depends. We may have a particular criteria. You know, All of us do. Hardware, but mine comes down to honesty in that if you tell me you're a reprobate, I'm good with that. You know, I'll, you I'll talk to y'all I can about it. I'll do everything that I think I'm led to, you know, to do. But, but well, it's the not having the truth to deal with. That's that mark. Well, that makes it. the breakdown on a lot of things. After, after you looked at that, well, the next question says, what qualities do you think were the most important for the Hebrew generation going into the promised land? What was, what is it? What would you think? Honesty would be one of them. But what do you really think is the most important? The knowledge of the God. Oh, 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 everybody's <laughs> talking at once. I can't hear everybody. All right, Sue, I'm going to come back to you, Joy. Oh, just that if, they, they were they were followers. They had to be followers of God's word at that time through their leaders. That's that's all we had was other human beings. But most important a, for them. It was a it was a God movement, so yeah. that would be the most important thing. Yes, you were saying. Just what Sue was saying. They had to have a world of faith, and they had to trust Moses. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. faith, trust. Because they didn't know honesty. anything. All they knew was what he was telling them. But they had to have faith in God that he had put him there for that purpose. Yeah. Had you ever thought that they were babes in the woods? They were. Yeah. They didn't know, aren't we? They aren't we? We still are. Yeah. <laughs> and what makes a local church have a good or a bad reputation in the community? The people. Actions. <laughs> Actions. Do what? Actions. Action. All right. right. Okay. Do what? Social media? Because it says a good or bad in uh, most here probably, at least I have read of the, a major church in this town, major church that is now suffering from the, we call it suffering. They're, They're suffering from a like bad reputation. Because, and you know, they were a good church and they had good people, had and had good people so, going there, I'm sure. They had a national president going there at one time. Uh, but they're apparently, uh, pride. I'm going to call it pride. The pride of the pastor people who were afraid to uh, be, honest. be honest with the people about something really bad going on. And it finally came out. And it's in the paper. And I don't know. I don't know them. They have. I don't know any of the people. I'm just going by what I read. So I don't know. And, and the situation you're talking about is, is get, it's, it's just keeping becoming worse and worse yes it yes, won't it, it, it isn't and, 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 it, and all of a sudden you've got to realize yeah. first off is the word you looked at is honesty is not yeah. there all right they sort of wanted to just let this covered up and it'll go away right. 
it yes. doesn't happen that way. And I got bad advice. Right. From legal, legal. legal advice and, and everything. And now so the church is. And I'm sure it's a good church. It's well, right. yes, but the fact is. It was a bad thing. It was a bad yes. thing that occurred in yes. the church, yes. which should have been well, snuffed yeah. out okay. immediately. And oh, it wasn't. Yeah. But the yeah. fact is, the people out in society says, well, if you do that, you're not being Christian. Right. Who is it we're supposed to be pleasing? <laughs> the one guy. That's, that but that, and, 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 and you're right. And that's not only happening here, it's happening all over. All right. It's not just, you know, the devil is alive and well. Yeah. And he really is pulling some really shenanigans to, to, to really and truly turn society against Christ. They, 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 they don't want that. You know, you don't want that down there. The cover it, up apparently is one of the worst things you can do. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the cover up is always worse than the crime. Yeah. Yeah. And it always yeah. I mean, is worse. It could, could have been and was taken care of, I think. No, I hope so. <laughs> so long as they're covering that up, so long as they're covering that up, so long as One, well, one negative no, can different. get rid of 50 no. good things. Yeah, yeah. Right. so you just yeah. really yeah. have Especially to. Especially yeah. by reputation. Yeah. yeah. Any thoughts? Okay, folks. Next week is Holy Week. It is. And you'll be meeting here on next Wednesday, and it's, I like it, it's all rigged. Rigged. <laughs> yeah. That'll be interesting. Oh, yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's going to be. <laughs> and this coming Sunday, we will be looking at overcoming obstacles. So, uh, we're going to prime the pump in that direction.